Thank you guys for tuning in today and welcome to another episode of The Source where we interview researchers, policy experts, former insiders or whistleblowers. I'm your host Zan Raza and today we'll be talking to a professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Bill Black. Bill is also a former financial regulator during the savings and loans debacle and is the author of the book called The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Bill, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much and I'm a serial whistleblower. And a serial whistleblower. So let's begin this interview with a scandal unfolding in Germany with a stockholding corporation that deals with financial services called Wirecard. Could you first talk about the work of Wirecard and then after surface what the scandal is all about? Sure. So Wirecard um, was supposed to be the great champion of the new Germany. Uh, and so Germany has always punched below its weight uh, in terms of finance for an enormous economic power. Uh, Frankfurt, frankly, isn't uh, in the first leagues uh, on finance. And this didn't even start in Frankfurt. Uh, this was uh, Munich, uh, München. Um, and also Europe in general has been weak in high tech. And this was FinTech, financial technology. Uh, it was supposed to put both of those things together. So it was great. And of course, it started like all good things in porn and gambling, right? <laughs> because this is the modern era. Uh, and so it was a payment system, and it was supposed to be a payment system that would keep more secret from folks that you were consuming a lot of porn. <laughs> that was sort of the key advantage uh, at first. Uh, and it started at a terrible time. It started just before the collapse of the dot-com boom. Uh, in the United States, which had fair global uh, implications. And, you know, it just sort of creeped along in creepy stuff. Uh, and then a, a, a hero came. Uh, and the hero wasn't German either. He was Austrian, uh, Herr Braun. Uh, and uh, eventually Herr Braun, like uh, the Therano scam in the United States, which is the blood scam, uh, the CEO adopted the Bill job, the you know thing, the black uh, shirts and 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 all that type of thing. So, you know, they're, so they're allegedly cool, uh, right? Uh, as well, and it had the usual warning signs to anybody like me who you know was a criminal, white collar criminologist. It had phenomenal results, not good results, phenomenal results. The economy could be tanking. Doesn't matter. Great financial crisis. Doesn't matter. Wirecard is just not just uh, making money; it's growing like crazy, right? Hundreds of percent a year in, in some years, and always declaring massive uh, revenue, and of course paying <laughs> a lot of money uh, to the executives. But hey, the executive is the CEO is the largest shareholder, so he couldn't be planning anything bad, right? Because that would hurt him. Uh, he owned 7% of the stock. Of course, he was pledging the stock as collateral on what are called margin loans from banks. And which banks? Well, of course, it's Deutsche Bank, right? Uh, so all, all the bad uh, pathologies of uh, Germany come together in Wirecard. And of course, it's a cheat. Uh, and it's a cheat that's an easy cheat. And again, as criminologists, here's the key thing. It ain't genius, it's audacity. And this, Braun had audacity <laughs> in spades. And he fooled not everybody, but the vast number of folks. So even months before the absolute collapse, which is now, you had 21 of 26 analysts that followed the company saying, buy, it's a great deal type of thing, right? And this is despite the fact that uh, for uh, a full two years now, Financial Times has been doing expose after expose. And in the financial world, Financial Times is considered the most sophisticated uh, entity and, and not one that hates finance as a course, right? So, so this is not a bunch of lefties. Um, and the scam is, uh, we lived uh, in Silicon Valley for 20 years uh, before coming here. 
Um, and this is the classic Silicon Valley scam. I sell uh, to you and you sell to me the same thing. <laughs> and we both declare profits. Now, nothing has happened substantively, right? This is a, just a pure accounting scam. So it's been hilarious from the perspective of somebody that this is actually my research specialty uh, with this hunt for the supposedly lost uh, $2 billion, right? Or 1.9 um, billion euros. Uh, because like it actually existed. <laughs> of course it never existed. Right? And they're just going, where's our 2 billion? Where's our 2 billion? Well, it was an accounting fiction from these uh, supposed trades, but it gets better because Boffin, which is uh, the German regulator, and it's one of these modern ones that's going to avoid the weaknesses of the United States where we've got a bazillion different fragmented agencies. It's going to be one uh, agency to rule finance, right? So it's a in the equivalent of the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission plus the, the uh, uh, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, like if, if you follow the United States. Boffin is supposed to stop these kinds of securities frauds, right? Boffin enlisted itself on behalf of Braun to stop the people that were trying to alert the public to these frauds. And Boffin, which moves like, well, we used to say like a glacier, but with global climate change, glaciers now actually move pretty fast. So, so think of basically uh, sludge and uh, negative 50 degrees Celsius, <laughs> right? You just barely can get it to move. That's how it usually is. But on this, they rushed in and they slapped an order, an unprecedented order that said nobody can short trade um, this stock, where card. Now, short trading, what that means is you're betting it's going to fall in value, right? Which is a good thing. You're alerting the public to, I think this stock is really overvalued. And why? Because they're cheaters, right? They make money the old fashioned way. They lie and steal using accounting, right? And, but <laughs> the securities regulator, instead of protecting the market said, you can't have any short selling. The first time this has ever been done, and they intervened on behalf of a fraud. But it gets better. Boffin has a web page. It's all about whistleblowers and how they love whistleblowers. And, you know, they really from here, come in, and you can do it anonymously and such. Well, Boffin also announced an investigation, an investigation of the journalists, not the company. <laughs> the journalists disclosing it. And of course, the journalists did their work on through who gave them the key information? Whistleblowers, apparently in Singapore. So Boffin's going to do an investigation that's going to inherently out the whistleblower. <laughs> and of course, this is a catastrophe. And so Wirecard, this nothing porn site <laughs> facilitator, becomes one of the largest companies, according to stock market capitalization, and that just means your stock price times the number of shares, in all of Germany. It becomes so big that in 2018, it replaces Commerzbank on the DAX index. So that the DAX is the basically the German Dow Jones uh, in this context, right? And that means, in this being Germany, Every friggin' pension fund has to buy stock in the DAX index, basically. And so you get a further rise in price because the fraud builds the next fraud uh, in all of this. So the German government reeling after Siemens, the super high-tech supposed hero before, turned out to be an entity that simply bribed uh, foreign countries, you know, poor countries left, right, and center. And then VW, the genius of engineering, turned out not to be just a fraud, but a friggin' nut-to-bolts fraud. And then it turned out it didn't have the expertise to do the 
emissions cheating. So it went to Bush and got Bush to do that. So that's your other expert. And what is your other great national champion? Deutsche Bank, which has gone from fraud to fraud to fraud. And Wirecard was supposedly bigger in capitalization than Deutsche Bank, which is a massive, albeit massively fraudulent, uh, operation. And what is the German answer to all of this? Why don't we try to merge Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank? We'll take two of the crappiest banks in the world and we'll stick them together and then make them a friggin' monopoly. And that's the solution to finance. So the German government is just totally screwed up. All this proud stuff. I mean, uh, Germany is the uh, place that founded Transparency International, the anti-corruption folks. And, uh, you know, they did their first index and Germany was number one in the least corrupt place uh, in the world. And as of late, in the face of these scandals, it's going up and up in the ratings. It's now number eight, uh, you know, type of thing. So uh, there's a huge problem of corruption. Nobody's listening to the things we've known before. As I said, this is a very old scam. It was too good to be true. All you had to have, and you had a whistleblower, a perfect whistleblower, right? All you had to do was utterly conventional things, and you could have stopped this fraud uh, 12 years ago. I want to provide a better understanding of this matter, uh, but before I do, let me just uh, tell our viewers that we interviewed Bill Black last year, and we did a, 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 a segment on the most fundamental aspects of how financial fraud and how the financial sector functions and the role of, for example, high frequency trading. So if you missed that, be sure to look it at, we'll link it in the link below. Uh, Bill, so I, I would like to dive a bit deeper into theory and examine your work on the three epidemics of elite fraud and predation. Could you define and describe these three epidemics and list a company ex examples of them? Sure. So this was in the context of the great financial crisis in the United States, but it's not unique to the United States. Um, and so the first one was uh, appraisal fraud. And this is a particularly great one. Um, I don't know what the German equivalent word for appraisal uh, is, but this is when you, uh, the expert that values your home, um, what its current market value is. And that's really important to the likelihood that the borrower will default and how much it would cost the bank uh, if the borrower defaulted. So uh, it's one of the great protections. We call it secured lending. The loan is secured by the pledge of the home, right? So this is really simple. It is amazingly, totally, absolutely in the interest of any honest banker to have a conservative view of the market value, right? That's, <laughs> nobody can dispute that. So here's the question, why did there become a nationwide campaign in the United States to extort appraisers, to inflate appraisals, and not by a little bit, but by huge amounts, and why did that pressure come overwhelmingly from the lenders and never from the borrower. Because of course the, the myth that was created in the United States, but also in Germany, by the way, was that this was poor people, right? Poor, in the US context, that meant people of color, right? So this is the famous um, origins of the Tea Party movement in the United States. This rant by Santelli, who was a commentator, um, who's his, and, and the rant, is by a bunch of people in finance saying, look, look, it's not us, it's those poor people of color. And Herr Henkel, the godfather of AfD in Germany, is the one who said, it went public and said, yes, the problem in the United States is that you stopped redlining. Redlining is a rule, uh, a phrase in the United States that refers to what was once the literal practice of federal, not just private, federal agencies literally drawing circles in red on U.S. maps around populations of color and saying, we're not going to provide insurance if you make loans in these areas. So Henkel was saying the problem was you started loaning to black people, right? 
And then he did that. Um, we in English we would say no ifs, ands, or buts. Ava then noto in German. Um, it, that uh, Sarazen uh, saying, you know, I agree with you completely. Uh, these uh, Arab uh, populations uh, and Turks and such are destroying uh, our country, and they are not even fit to be fruit vendors, uh, type of thing. That's the guy that was the person behind the founding of AfD in uh, Germany. So this has root powerful political implications in both countries. So that's the first one. And that appraisal fraud tells us, hey, this ain't poor people. They have no ability to inflate appraisals. They don't hire the appraiser, the bank does. So clearly the fraud is actually coming from the banker. Second one, liar's loans. All right. This is what the industry called them behind closed doors. This is a loan where you make it and you don't verify the borrower's income, which is super easy to do in the United States context. Even if you're self-employed, we just use your tax returns. And how many people deliberately inflate their income on an income tax return? <laughs> Nobody, right? So it's a super reliable, super cheap system. And what percent of these liars' loans were fraudulent and had inflated income? Well, the industry's own anti-fraud experts reported that it was 90 percent, nine zero. So they're virtually all fraudulent. Nobody ever in the federal government urged people to make these kinds of loans. And these are not loans you're making to poor people because what are you doing? You're inflating the income. Right. So you're not trying to <laughs> curry favor or saying, hey, I'm loaning to poor people. You're making it look like you're um, loaning to upper middle income people. And there's a great study uh, that now has come out. Um, and I think between when we've done these interviews uh, that shows that 70 percent of the total losses in the United States came from these liars' loans. So you, everybody knows it's called the subprime crisis in the United States, but in fact, it's the liars' loans crisis. And by 2006, half of all the loans called subprime were also liars' loans in the United States. So again, borrowers can't I insist, hey, give me money without me tell telling you what my income is and verifying it. Only bankers can do that. And they did. So we know that came from the bankers as well. Plus, we have examples where bankers did these own tests and found that they were making monumentally fraudulent loans, whereupon in both cases that we know about, and these are big cases, these are uh, Wells Fargo and these are countrywide. In the U.S. context, these are two of the biggest makers of these kinds of loans. And the reaction of both cases was of senior management when they got these reports that they were overwhelmingly fraudulent was, great, do many more of them. Let's expand it dramatically. Um, <laughs> Wells Fargo, you'll love this as a label, decided to label this after learning they were overwhelmingly fraudulent and saying, let's do lots more of them. They called it courageous underwriting. And... Uh, countrywide called it extreme, and then there's a euphemism for liars' loans called Alt A, which I won't bother to explain. But they said, let's go to the more extreme variant of this. Okay, so these are the two loan origination fraud schemes, right? These are baked in as soon as the loans are made. The third is the fact that uh, you know there's basically nothing magic you can do once you start out with fraudulent loans. You know you uh, can't have a purification ritual with a priest <laughs> and, and exercise the fraud, right? It's baked in. So if you're going to sell it to the secondary market, and it was typical to sell this to what is called a secondary market, that just means a buyer. Uh, a big financial entity buys these packages of liars' loans. Well, the only way to do that is by lying to them 
and saying, hey, these are good loans. These are not fraudulent loans. And in jargon in the United States, those are called representations and warranties. A representation is just what it sounds like. A warranty is just what it sounds like. Hey, I'm warranting. I'm standing behind this promise, right? That these are not like the liars loans are not liars. <laughs> that type of thing. And again, remember, overwhelmingly, it's the banks that put the lies in liars loans, not the poor people, right? And so the third is when you sell to the secondary market, the only way you can do that. Now, this third one doesn't increase the number of fraudulent loans directly. It, it redistributes who's going to suffer the losses. But that's important because in economic neoclassical ed, economic theory, these loans would be spread into the secondary market in the optimal way that would uh, diversify uh, perfectly and the entities that could best hold this risk would have. The, none of that was true. Of course, that was all just bullshit. Right. This is Goldman Sachs looking for the weakest folks, which included regional banks uh, in, in Germany in the context of their publicly owned banks in the German context. Uh, homes. I'm, I'm sorry. Towns, little towns with 20,000 people in Norway. Right. These are the least uh, sophisticated financially folks. And that's who they look to skim, uh, to scam and, and we would, you know, have other words we can't say. Um, but, you know, it, it's a really nasty practice. But on top of what I've said, let me just mention, particularly given today's um, world in, in America, there was also connected with the liar's loans an epidemic of predation. And that predation was aimed overwhelmingly at people of color. And that predation in most particular, the group they most uh, liked to target was elderly African-American widows. So um, th that comes out of the savings and loan debacle where you know where I got my start in dealing with this in the United States, where the famous line of the most notorious for fraud there was the weak, the meek, and the ignorant are our greatest targets. Now, I'm not saying these folks are in fact weak, meek, and ignorant, but that's how they're perceived by the uh, predators, right? So um, this produced the greatest loss of wealth among black and Latino households in the history of the United States. And you know we have a terrible history when it comes to both. So if the college-educated households that are Latino lost over 60% of their total wealth during the great financial crisis, largely as a result of this, blacks lost right around 60%. So it was 66 and 60%. It, it, the exact number depends on your timing, uh, but it's staggering. An entire generation, maybe two to three generations of wealth was eliminated in, a, in an eight year period. So I would like to pick up on this I would say, if I could call it the model of fraud, for example, you talked about appraisal, verification and selling. Could this be also applied, for example, in scandals that involve Huawei, which uh, does, for example, um, uh, it, it uh, promotes the value of its products beyond what it is and does not verify or m installs devices in its cars that provide Uh, that give a wrong reading uh, of its pollution levels and then sells it, or you could say redistributes it in the market. Can you also apply this sort of fraud model um, into other sectors of the economy? And that's the part one of the question. And part two of the question is, uh, has this epidemic been addressed uh, since the great crash? Or is this now um, in all parts of our economy Uh, rooted now where we are heading to a big financial crash. What is your assessment on that? Okay, so starting with your second question, no, it hasn't been addressed. No, it isn't everywhere. <coughs> And no, I don't think that the equivalent of a great financial crisis from these frauds as opposed to the COVID is necessarily imminent. But that's in many ways the bad news. The longer it builds, the larger the bubbles. 
So uh, to broaden um, my d discussion, there are many kinds, but let's focus on two kinds of these elite frauds. The one I was describing, uh, it, we call accounting control fraud, and it is analogous to the Enron era frauds, and it's um, highly analogous to Wirecard. Quickly, what is Enron? Just quickly. So these are scams usually that involve looting. And in fact, um, if your readers want to look, there are two Nobel Prize winners uh, who wrote about this in the savings and loan debacle in 1993. And the title is Looting the Economic Underworld a Bankruptcy for Profit. Okay, so this kind of looting, you're deliberately making bad transactions to create phony income. And if we have time, I can explain why bad transactions work better than good transactions for creating this sure thing. And that language, sure thing, is critical. It's one that the Nobel Prize winners used as well, but they adopted it from us, the savings and loan regulators. So we're the ones that tried to figure out this Detective story, right? It's insane. And we've known it's insane for millennia to make loans without doing what we in uh, English is called underwriting. And the underwriting is we usually use call it the three C's. So that would be collateral, which we discussed in the appraisal. That would be capacity to repay the loan. That's do you have the income that we discussed. Um, and um, the Third is credit, and everybody young knows that, that's your credit rating, and that exists through Europe and the United States, uh, right? So you have to have all three of those things to get a home loan in the United States. Why? Because if you don't, in jargon, you create adverse selection, and, and that's economics. It just means you end up with the worst possible borrowers who will have the highest default rates and the highest losses when you do have the defaults. So. We've known, U.S., of course, I said we've known as a people, humans, for millennia about this. The United States, of course, is quite young, so we've only known for centuries <laughs> in the U.S. context. But we've known for centuries that about banking. So we asked ourselves as regulators, why in God's name do we see they're not just not doing good underwriting. They're doing off-the-walls incredibly incompetent, terrible underwriting. So it's like you put in football, the worst possible team out there, and then you declared they won every game, eight nil, right? But what they're really doing, of course, is in the English use, just a whole series of own goals, right? I, I know the German term is different. Uh, Agentor. Translates to, yeah. Um, but, and then they declare success and we don't probably have time this go around to explain the accounting, but the key is accounting. So that's why we call these accounting control frauds. They're all accounting scams. They're all involved things like these fake trades that uh, Enron did and Wirecard uh, is alleged to have done, uh, actually documented to have done, of course, and documented for years to have done this. Uh, and those create fictional income, and then you declare victory, your stock price goes up enormously, you grow and repeat uh, type of thing. So those frauds are particularly destructive, and they are very good at creating bubbles when they're done by financial firms. And that's why I said the longer it expands, the worse the news. So the fact that we're not about to blow up is not particularly good news because that means the bubbles are getting bigger. What I'll call VW, the American pronunciation, um, does it very differently. That was a fraud designed to profit, make real profit, but real sleazy profit, right? So yes, there are all kinds of things. And again, by the way, it's the same Nobel Prize winner that wrote, is a co-author of the um, 1993 article on looting is uh, the author in 1970 of the, uh, his name is George Akerlof, uh, of the 
article on lemons. Now, lemons is a phrase in the United States. I don't know if you use it in Germany for a terrible car, not a bad car, but just a terrible, awful car that's in the repair shop uh, every week uh, type of thing, right? And so you're going to lose amount, terrible amounts of money. And Akerlof's point was information in his jargon was asymmetric. And that just means the seller knows a hell of a lot more about the quality of the car than the buyer does. And that's particularly true in the what we call the used car. So this is the secondary sales uh, type of thing. And so Romer says, hey, you know what they do? They lie about the quality of the car. Say, hey, this is a good car. And then they get a whole lot much more money and they can buy the car really cheap because they know it's a crappy car and the person selling it to them knows it's a crappy car. So if you can buy really cheap and sell unusually high, you have great profits. And Akerlof's further insight was that this produces something really bad. And this is something you won't learn in regular economics that I hope everybody in your viewership learns. This is called a Gresham's dynamic. And what that means is if you gain a competitive advantage by cheating, then markets become perverse and bad ethics drives good ethics out of the marketplace, right? Because if the cheaters prosper by lying about the quality of the car, who was unable to compete with them? The honest merchant. Um, and by the way, this goes all the way back to Swift, is in the Irish Swift, is in Gulliver's Travels, who says the same thing in 1727. <laughs> But the economist, you know, eventually uh, listened. Uh, again, it's the truth tellers, the narratives, the people that like you're trying to do, who often bring us the truth centuries before the economist uh, can uh, figure these things out. That VW produced a Gresham's dynamic. In fact, VW argues it was responding to a Gresham's dynamic saying, hey, we didn't cheat first. What do you think all these other folks are doing? And when we, when testing has been done on other diesel manufacturers, they too, in road tests, are vastly over the limits, Some, you know, sometimes by 2,000% uh, over the, the limits. But VW was particularly nasty because it was a whole series of frauds. It wasn't just, we're going to do a fraud. It's, how are we going to make sure our fraud isn't detected? And as I said, um, VW didn't feel it had the technical expertise to pull its, uh, this off itself. So it went to uh, the markets and got Bosch, which in essence, uh, I'll call it the computer. The co it, it has a more technical term in, in uh, auto manufacturing. But basically, Bosch makes the computer that runs your car. Modern vehicles are run by a computer internally to the car, right? And Bosch not only made the one that would allow you to sense when you were connected to a test bed and then change the engine parameters on the test bed, but not on the road, so that it would suddenly emit far fewer emissions. But of course, if you'd put on the road, the car would have been moving at 20 kilometers an hour. <laughs> which wouldn't work very well on the Autobahn you know, type of thing. So it's a complete scam. But Bush didn't just do that. It did it a generic one. So any many different manufacturers could enter their own individual parameters to let them scam these things. And this has is, by the way, another important principle in economics. There's a group of folks who, and I won't explain why, uh, are called Austrian economists. Austrian economists are known as the like the super right wing of economics. Uh, we don't need no stinking government. We're the road to serfdom. Uh, you know, if the government provides keeps people from dying from illnesses, we're all on the road to serfdom uh, type of thing. And one of their things is a spontaneous order. That the great thing about markets is they simply provide whenever there's a profit opportunity. That has substantial truth but it has substantial truth in both ways. If what you're doing is a scam that will kill people and drive honest manufacturers out of business, 
That's bad, right? That's really, really bad. Then Bosch will step up and say, hot damn, we can do that for you. And we can do it in a way that fools people uh, and such. And we'll get con total control of the European market for these computers, which Bosch pretty damn close came to getting, right? So Wirecard did the same thing. It's, it's So a key thing, we call these control frauds. This is when the, I'll call him the CEO for short, but the title doesn't matter. Whoever actually controls the corporation in management uses it as a weapon and a shield to commit frauds, elite frauds, and enrich themselves, right? So that's the key. And um, there's a great book about industrial strength denial, about how these corporations, they don't just defend themselves, they attack. Whenever they're doing sleazy things, lead, you know, producing lead in gasoline, slavery, uh, tobacco, they they create fake research. They attack the honest researchers. They try to smear them, and the market provides all of those things. So in wire cards, they wanted to defame the Financial Times folks. They wanted to defame the whistleblowers and such. They wanted to out the whistleblowers. So what did they do? They went and hired the former head of Libyan intelligence, Libyan intelligence as their spy. And they went to this scam that's just been revealed in, in this case in India, um, where the... Uh, what they do is dirty tricks, um, uh, phishing operations, but not general ones, targeted to the individual. So they go into your Facebook and they pick things that they'll know it looks like you're a friend and, and that you really know them and you're more likely to reply. But as soon as you hit reply, you've launched a phishing operation. And then they went in and they stole all this, uh, you know, uh, private information, particularly of the Financial Times investigators, trying again to out the whistleblowers, right? So the market does provide spontaneously whenever the profit opportunity, and that's the good news, and that's the terrible news uh, as well that you'd never learn in an economics class taught anywhere in the country or world, except maybe Kansas City. Bill Black, former financial regulator, white collar criminologist and author. Thank you so much for your time. Let us continue uh, this conversation in part two. Thank you. And thank you guys for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the bell below and to donate so we can continue to produce independent and nonprofit news and analysis. I'm your host, Zan Raza. See you guys next time.